My name is Gary Kramer. I'm a freelance writer for The Jewish Exponent, among other public publications. And tonight, Edgar Kerrett will read and discuss his new book, The Seven Good Years, with the Free Library's Director of Author Events, Andy Cahan. Kerrett's memoir, his first foray into nonfiction, consists of vignettes of his life as framed by the seven years between the birth of his son and the death of his father. In the book, Carrot describes the bedtime stories his father read him as being filled with magic and compassion, about a desperate need to find good in the least likely of places, to, as he writes, put ugliness in a better light. Carrot's cockeyed perspective informs all of his work, from his beloved absurdist short stories to his remarkable film Jellyfish, and now this revealing new memoir. Describing his writing is almost as tricky as the tightrope the author walks between realism and surrealism. But everything he writes creates a sense of awe and wonder, provoking a short, sharp laugh, or a sense of familiarity, even in the strangest of situations. Carrot reveals how, in writing his first short story and giving it to his brother to read, he discovered the magic of transmitting his feelings to his sibling, who used the paper to clean up after his dog. He also offers wisdom he has come to learn over the years, as when he advises, if you ever drop your watch into a machine full of blades, don't do something stupid like reach in and get it. In the seven good years, Carrot writes with perspicacity and considerable humor about living in Israel, being a parent and a child, and most effectively, about mortality and the human condition. He considers life during wartime in Israel, which is an everyday occurrence, he wonders if the house that was made in the proportion of his stories, minimalist and as small as possible, is a practical joke. And he has intense fights with and about taxi drivers. He also dreams of a flying fish singing in a voice that sounds a bit like Celine Dion's. And this may be what forms Corette's beguiling form of literary magic. He creates suspense and surprise, which is what all great short pieces, fiction or nonfiction, should do. When Corette bemoans the work he, might make, he, he writes might make more sense in Hebrew, he admits, I love reading to people. When they enjoy it, I enjoy it with them. And when they suffer, I figure it's probably coming to them. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Edgar Carrot and Andy Cahan. Hi, good evening. So there is an honest disclosure before the reading. Uh, uh, this is basically, the f it's a new book and it's the first time I read from it in English. And English is not my first tongue. So if at any point you don't understand what I'm saying, you know, uh, because of my pronunciation and, and or my accent, then just imagine three years from now, I'm in Cleveland. I read it and it actually makes sense, okay? Just kind of, <laughs> with time, it's gonna get better. <laughs> Suddenly, the same thing. I just hate terrorist attacks. The thin nurse says to the older one, want some gum? The older nurse takes a piece and nods. What can you do, she says. I also hate emergencies. It's not the emergencies, the thin one insists. I have no problem with accidents and things. It's the terrorist attacks, I'm telling you. They put a damper on everything. Sitting on the bench outside the maternity ward, I think to myself, she's got a point. I got here just an hour ago, all excited, with my wife and a neat freak taxi driver who, when my wife's water broke, was afraid it would ruin his upholstery. And now I'm sitting in the hallway, feeling gloom waiting for the staff to come back from the ER. Everyone but the two nurses has gone to help treat the people injured in the attack. My wife's contractions have slowed down too. Probably even the baby feels this whole getting born thing isn't that urgent anymore. As I'm on my way to the cafeteria, a few of the, the injured roll past, past on squeaking gurneries. gurneys. In the, taxis, in the taxi on the way to the hospital, my wife was screaming like a mad woman, but all these people are quiet. Are you Edgar Carrot? A guy wearing a checkered shirt asks me. 
the writer, I nod reluctantly. Well, what do you know, he says, pulling a tiny tape recorder out of his bag. Where were you when it happened, he asks, and when I hesitate for a second, he says in a show of empathy, take your time, don't feel pr pressured, you've been through a trauma. I wasn't in the attack, I explained, I, I just happened to be here today, my wife's giving birth. Oh, he says, not trying to hide the disappointment, and presses the stop button on his tape, re uh, tape recorder. Mazel tov. Now he sits down next to me and lights himself a cigarette. Maybe you should try talking to someone else, I suggest, as an attempt to get the lucky strike smoke out of my face. A minute ago, ago I saw them take two people into neuro neurology. Russians, he says with a sigh. Don't know a word in Hebrew. Besides, they don't let you, besides, they don't let you into neurology anyway. This is my seventh attack in this hospital, and I know the, the shtick by now. We sit there a minute without talking. He's about 10 years younger than I am, but starting to go bald. When he c catches me looking at him, he smiles and says, too bad you weren't there. A reaction from a writer would have been good for my article. Someone original, someone with a little vision. After every attack, I always get the same reactions. Suddenly I heard a boom. I don't know what happened. Everything was covered in blood. How much of those can you take? It's not their fault, fault, I say. It's just that the attacks are always the same. What kind of original thing can you say about an explosion and senseless death? Beats me, he says with, with a shrug. You're the writer. Some people in white jackets are starting to come back from the ER on their way to the maternity ward. You're from Tel Aviv, the reporter says to me. So why do you come all the way to this stump to, to give birth? We wanted a natural birth. The department here naturally interrupts sniggering. What's natural about a midget with a cable hang hanging from his belly button popping out of your wife's vagina? I don't even try to respond. I told my wife, he continues, if you ever give birth only by cesarean section, like in America, I don't want some baby stretching you out, out of shape for me. Nowadays, it's only in primitive countries that, like, like this that women give birth like animals. Yalla, I'm going to work. Starting to get up, it rises one more time. Maybe you have something to say about the attack anyway, he asks. Did it change anything for you, like what you're going to name the baby or something? I don't know. I smile apologetically. Never mind, he says with a wink. I hope it goes easy, man. Six hours later, a midget with a cable hanging from his belly button comes popping out of my wife's vagina and immediately starts to cry. I try to calm him down, to convince, convince him that there's nothing to worry about, that by the time he grows up, everything here in the Middle East will be settled. Peace will come. There won't be any more terrorist attacks. And even if once in a blue moon there is one, there will always be someone original, someone with a little vision ar around to describe it perfectly. He quiets down and then considers his next move. He's supposed to be naive, seeing as how he's a newborn, but even he doesn't buy it. And after a second's hesitation and a small hiccup, he goes back to crying. Well, I think that reading worked out just fine. Do you agree? They applauded. <laughs> okay. okay. So we're just going to kibitz for a bit up here, and then um, we'll throw it open to you. So I hope you have some questions. So how did you know that um, after Love was born that he was going to be um, an enlightened psychopathic junkie? <laughs> well, it was easy to tell, I think. Uh, no, I, th I think that, that there is something w in the perspective when you look at a baby is that every uh, different second he's a completely different human being because you can see them when they're at ease, they're completely at ease. And when they cry, they cry as if, like, you know, Earth is going to be destroyed. And when they're angry, you can't control their anger. So 
So it's really being a new father, like every few minutes I thought I got it figured out and then I, 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 I saw somebody else kind of, you know, interacting with me. Do you remember his first smile? Was it an actual smile or was it gas? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, I, I remember, it's like, uh, it's actually, my, my late father was the one who made him smile. He would make this kind of strange sound, he would say, a goo I don't know, and like, he had this kind of smile. It was a slightly patronizing. Did, like he looked at my, at my father and said, aren't you too old to make those strange <laughs> sounds? But, uh, but he was happy. So do you make that sound now? Uh, I, tr I tried to kind of ask him if he remembers that he used to like it and, and he doesn't and he kind of, he is also very indifferent to this sound <laughs> now. Right. So your father is a fascinating character um, throughout the book. And when I initially picked it up, I thought, all right, it's, about, it's all about Lev, and then it's all about Dad. But interwoven throughout the book is just life as it occurs in Israel for Edgar, along with some typically uh, Caretian twists and turns. But just returning to your father, I wonder if you could tell us a little more about him, more specifically, um, how he met your mother, the circumstances around that, because that's such a great story. Uh, and then I'll follow up from there. Yeah, well, uh, but, but I just want, want to say that there was, there was something about the way in which I was brought up, that my parents were both uh, Holocaust survivors, and, uh, and they ne both did, did not have a normal childhood. And my mother was orphaned in a very early age, and my father was with his parents, but he spent two years in a hole in the ground, you know, which was like too, uh, too shallow for them to, st to stand in and it wasn't wide enough for them to lie down. So they basically sat for two years in a hole in the ground. So, so w my mother would always say w when they raised us, she said that, that usually uh, the way what you do when you become a parent, you look at your own childhood and if you had a good childhood, then you try to repeat what your parents did, and if you had a bad one, you do the opposite. And she said, I don't have any reference, you know. Mm. I'm kind of improvising here. Even when we were kids, so she said, if I do something and it looks wrong to you, tell me, because it may be wrong, you know. I don't know how to do it. And I, I feel that, that there was something about my parents all the time that they, that they never kind of tried to simplify anything in life for, for us. They would just kind of say things the way that they saw, saw them. And uh, and I remember that when I was uh, when I was young, I uh, when I was I think maybe eight or nine, I asked my father what was the thing that he was most proud of in his life, and my father kind of gave it some thought, and then he said, w "I think the thing I'm most proud of is that uh, I've fought in five wars, always uh, in the infantry, always in the front line." and I've never hurt anybody. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that, you know, this is kind of, this is some complex legacy for a kid who wants to be like his father, like, you know, like you say, okay, like, I mean, if my, if my father would say, you know, I made my first million when I was 20, I would say, okay, you know, I must think of a startup. But when your father gives you something, it really kind of says, you know, don't chicken out, go out there and fight but don't hurt anybody, then you're bound to become a writer, you know, because, <laughs> because there's no way in real life that you can kind of sort this kind of oxymoron out, you know. Yeah. Only my father could have done it, like, you know, be there, run, shoot, and not hit anybody. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> well, and be proud of that. It sounds like you've, you've figured a way to sort it out a bit, though. Um, specifically with regard to um, your father giving you some advice that you incorporated into your writing. Um, and I'm thinking about when he would tell you bedtime stories. And oh, those bedtime yeah. stories gave you sort of a way in and a, to write and approach writing. At least that's the impression I got from reading it. Uh, yeah, yeah. W w the thing with my, my, both my parents would tell us bedtime stories, and the thing with my uh, mother is that w one of her most powerful memories and most pleasant memories were the bedtime stories that, that her parents would tell her in the ghetto. And in the ghetto, they had no books. So 
it was kind of an unwritten law that you need to kind of make up stories, that reading from a book is cheating. And for, for my mother, like reading from a book would be like kind of ordering a pizza, you know, it's what a, a, la a lazy parent does, you know. But a, like a, a parent who really loves his child kind of, you know, prepares a fresh story each day, relevant for what had happened today. And sometimes when she couldn't tell, tell us stories, and my father would tell us stories, and my, my father d couldn't invent stories like my mom. He could tell stories, but he, he would always tell stories that had happened to him. And these stories w were really, really amazing. And, and there was something very warm and humane in every story that he told. Like, you know, the, the amazing thing was the story could have seven characters. And some of them were, could have been the bad guys, the good guys, but somehow you understood all of them. You know, all of them were in a sense human. And I think that uh, this was a, a, a kind of an instinctive lesson for me for what writing is about. You know, writing is about showing things as they are, but also with some kind of compassion and empathy. You know, this is what art is about. And, and my father's stories also had one, another thing in common, that they always took place in a whorehouse. And the... Uh, Can you tell why that is? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. But, but also the protagonists were not only prostitutes, they would be usually prostitutes, mafia guys, and drunk people. And as a five years old, you know, when you ask your father, like, uh, what's a prostitute? And uh, you say, oh, it's somebody who's, who gets paid to listen to other people's troubles. <laughs> and what's a mafia guy? It's those people that they collect rent from buildings that they don't own. <laughs> uh, and what's a drunk person? That's uh, somebody who has these medical conditions that the more liquid he drinks, the happier he becomes, you know? <laughs> And at the age of five, you kind of encountered your f first dilemma, like, w what would I be when I grew up? A drunk prostitute or a drunk mafia guy? Because in the stories, they both sound kind of cool, you know, so... But, but when I was older and I asked him, like, why did you tell me these stories? You know, because at some age, you understand that this is not kind of appropriate. Then, then my, my, my father told me that he said, like, when you see a kid, you won't tell them stories about your, li your life as a kid, but my life as a kid, you know, like, what would I tell a story about how they caught my, my kid sister and tortured her to death, but still, you know, she wouldn't tell where we were hiding. It's not a good bedtime story for a five-year-old, you know? So I kind of looked, I kind of fast-forwarded in my life to this first, first period, which was kind of happy enough to tell. And he said that this period came uh, after he tried to come to Israel, he was caught by the British who had sent him to Cyprus and he joined, jo joined the Irgun, uh, who was an underground who fought the British, and they assigned him to buy weapons from the Italian mafia for the Irgun. And when he was in Italy, in a town called Reggio Calabria, because he couldn't even afford a place to stay, then the mafia guys had offered him to stay in a whorehouse they have owned. And for eight months, he stayed at that whorehouse, and he said, well, it's the first time in my adult life that I, I didn't have to hide the fact that I was a Jew, that I, you know, I wasn't afraid when I went to sleep. And he said, and the people there, you know, I mean, he said some of them, like, were mafia guys, they killed other people, but he said, but believe me, compared to the Nazis, they were nice. <laughs> so he said, so I thought, you know, this I can tell, you know, at five years old, and these were the stories that I've heard. And, and, and in the end, like, in the, even now when I kind of try to remember them, then, then the, f the, the roles that people had in life, you know, if they were criminals or, you know, it really had the, no importance for the story. The story didn't judge them in any way. They were just people, you know, trying, trying to get by. And that's something that... That's an ethos that pervades your stories as well. There's not a lot of judgment, at least that I've noticed. I, I must say a, a strange thing that in life I'm very judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> and in that sense that, you know, that sometimes when I kind of find myself that, you know, that I see somebody, like, you know, it's not, usually it, it could be some, somebody I don't know, but I, I read an, an essay or I read an interview and, like, and there is somebody that, that I don't like and I kind of, find myself that I keep ranting about him, you know, like saying to my wife, look at this guy, like, you know. Then at the stage when it starts getting on my nerves and I start really not liking myself, 
I sit down and I write a fiction story about this person because instantly when you write a story about this guy, like about the things that annoys you, then you have to humanize with it, you know? So you have to be that guy. You have to understand why he did that. And, and you know, and whenever I do that, many times it's not always that a sto good story comes out, you know? Like I have a couple of stories that started with writing about somebody I didn't like. Uh, but many times... No, nothing good comes out of it, but I always feel that after writing, I kind of, uh, I become less, less judgmental. So it'll change your opinion about the, the, the piece that you read to write about it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, we, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't change my opinion in the sense that if I thought something was wrong, it becomes right. But it kind of, uh, it humanizes the person in it. You know, it's kind of like when I write it in the end, like he's wrong, but he's not an asshole. Right. He's just wrong, <laughs> and I think I think it's it's really like a, 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 when you go on the highway and somebody I don't know cuts you or something, and you stop and you say, "Hey, you piece of shit! You know where did you learn to drive in a supermarket? You know." <laughs> and imagine like this guy says, uh, "Oh, sorry, no, I actually I drive well. It's just that uh, uh, my mother is very ill." And you know, I didn't have where to put the children, so I was just kind of on the way to, to pick them up, and I was thinking about my mother because she said to me something, and she said, "I'm sorry, I called you a piece of shit. <laughs> you're a nice guy, and I, I bet you're a good driver." It's like you know, really, it, my my wife always makes fun of me that usually when I she said when you get into fights, like you, let's say when you fight somebody in the street, she says, "I hear you shouting, but I know it's gonna end with you." buying a present to this guy, Bar Mitzvah, and standing there <laughs> awkwardly, you know, and, and it really does, because, you know, I kind of, there is something sometimes desperate in the ways that I fight it. Like, I, like my subject is, I don't want to know you. I don't want to know what's in, in your heart. Please stay somebody I don't like. But, you know, but then it's enough, like, that somebody would do some, a little thing that is human, and it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, that story you just described happened to me on the way to pick you up tonight. I parked the car a little quick, and I banged into the guy behind me, and he had a brand new car, and I've got this really old car, and he jumped out and he said, You're, you drive like a crazy man. And I said, I don't drive like a crazy man. I just, my, I have another car, it's smaller. He said, oh, all right, it's smaller. <laughs> I said, well, I have another car, and it's bigger. And he showed me his, his keychain. Anyway, so I suddenly wasn't the total asshole that he thought I was. I mean, I was, but he let me go. Um, so many stories about your... Fat. Well, maybe next time he, yeah. he could come and pick me up in his bigger car. <laughs> I'll have more leg room. It's a nicer car, <laughs> believe me. I want to continue on stories about your family. Um, tell us about your sister, because she's something of a departure from the rest of the clan. Uh, yeah, well, my, my sister uh, uh, had become a, an outer orthodox after a compulsory army service. Uh, and uh, she, she has uh, 11 children and 15 grandchildren at the age of 52. Uh, and she's and she's a, an amazing human being, and and you know that she told me the story. I actually, she told me that during the shiva, when we said for for my father, that uh, uh, before she went to Bnei Brak, which is a very kind of a religious city, where she w first went to to learn uh, or to join kind of a, an ulpana, which is like a school for women who want to be become religious, uh, she, she asked my, f my father to go with her to a cafe. And like, you know, we are usually like we have talks at home, we don't sit in a cafe, and my father was kind of, uh, uh, said, why? She said, I want to sit with you, I want to have a conversation with you. And he and said, okay, what do you want to say? And she said, you know, I just want to say to you that after we finish our coffee, when I get up, I'm going to take a bus here, and I'm going to go to this religious town, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to become the most extreme ultra-orthodox you, you can ever imagine. And she said, I want to say to you in advance, so you won't be able to say later on that they brainwashed me 
or they pushed me more to the extreme. I'm telling you, I'm secular now, I don't know anything, but I'm going there all the way. And why? why? Why did she want to do that? Did you ever find out? Uh, well, I think that she, she was always kind of fascinated with some kind of energy that she associated with religion. And, you know, and during the Lebanon war, she, she was an artillery instructor. Uh, and she trained the uh, artillery officers and, uh, and her fiancé, who, whom she met during training, uh, had died in the f first two weeks of the war. So, so I think that uh, it kind of put her in a more kind of existential state, kind of trying to find out, uh, you know, why, why we're here and what it's all about. And she got her answer. She seems to be very happy, according very, to Very, very happy. And she's like, she's very, uh, I, I, she's very extreme, as she promised, but she's a Hasidic, she's a breast lover, and they're kind of like the, the hippies of the ultra-Orthodox. <laughs> so they, they really believe that the biggest mitzvah, you know, the best thing you can do is to be happy. So basically, it's kind of like they train all their life to be happy, and I can tell you, they become really good at it. Like, you know, I was, uh, I was in her apartment when some, because of some installation problem, you know, like a pipe kind of broke and it sprayed the entire living room with water. And like in 20 seconds, the kids were holding hands and dancing around the water, <laughs> you know? And they like say, oh, like, you know, we have a fountain in our living room, no. And that would not happen in your house. What? And that would not happen in your house. No, no, no. We 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 usually we not not we not dancers. We call the plumber. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Moving on to your brother now, your brother, the elephant whisperer. Yeah. Um, how did his path deviate from the rest of the family? Yeah. Well, I think like in, in my uh, in my family, there's never kind of a clear trajectory. So my brother. He was, a, uh, they found out he was a genius in a very, very young age. He basically, he graduated, uh, a, a, he, he did his final exams, like he finished high school when he was 14. Uh, when he was 15, he, he had a girlfriend that was 23 or 24. I, like, she seemed very old to me at the time. And they lived together. And when he uh, was 15? Yeah, and <laughs> I, mean, I hope my daughters aren't hearing this. <laughs> yeah, no. The funny thing about it was like at the time I was nine, and I say, "Wow, in six years, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna have a girlfriend and have an apartment." And like when I was 15, like you know, I didn't even found a girl who allowed me to kiss her on the cheek, you know. Uh, and my brother, uh, uh, during his university days, you know. He was actually a right-wing activist, and uh, in the Lebanon war, because he was so smart, he found a trick to, uh, to make the range of anti-airplane missiles uh, big, uh, longer, and because the Syrian airplanes would fly above the height of the maximum range, and he helped kind of make it a little bit uh, longer, and basically something like 20 minutes after we explained to his commander what you can do to get to a, a longer range, a plane passed, they shut it down, uh, the pla plane was burning, the pilot and navigator were unable to bail out, and my brother heard them burning to death. And uh, since that day, he became an extreme left-wing liberal. Uh, and uh, he also started the legalized marijuana movement in Israel. <laughs> and 10 years ago, him and his wife, they moved to Thailand, where they continued their social activism from a tree house with a high-speed internet connection. <laughs> but a few years ago, they kind of, they settled down, and now they just live in a place, it's in a village, they don't have an air condition, they wash themselves with a bucket, but they're not on the tree anymore. My, father, uh, my brother said, I'm over 50, you know. I said, I'll live on the tree until I'm 51, and then I... Time to have some comforts in life. Yeah. <laughs> that leaves your mother. Well, there's still somebody left. 
Um, can you tell a bit about her story as well? Because it sounds like she went through the ringer as a child. Yeah, yeah. Well, my mother, first of all, uh, she, uh, when the war started, uh, she was uh, less than six years old. And their parents very, very quickly found themselves in the Warsaw Ghetto, where my mother basically had to help the family survive because children, you know, could do things that adults couldn't go with. So she would smuggle food. She would. She had these things that she, that uh, when uh, uh, Nazis, w she would see Nazis uh, smoking cigarettes, so she would stand close to them, and when they throw the cigarette on the floor. You know, and to step on it, she would snatch it, and she would tell me that she would hold the butt, and she knew that they're gonna kick her, so she would kind of brace herself, and they kicked her, and she would keep the butts, and then she would open them and roll cigarettes from them and sell those cigarettes. So, and, and later on, they were moved to another ghetto, which was something that saved had saved her life, and in that other ghetto, her mother and brother got f killed and later her father got killed and she stayed on her own and uh, she escaped to the Ar Ar Aryan side and and uh, pretended to be and pretended to be and somebody who's not Jewish and uh, it was it was actually strange that uh, uh, I, I'm, I I want to say something and then I think it's too personal. Okay, I won't. <laughs> you can say it if you want. No, no. Okay. So, so, it, so when we went to Poland, like my my mother never wanted to return to Poland, and uh, and we went there like basically after she hadn't been there in seventy years, and her whole attitude was really she wanted to see things that had to do with her childhood. She wanted to discover things, but at the same time. She didn't come to kind of relieve the trauma, you know. So when we went to the Jewish museums, they have eight galleries, and each of them kind of uh, is about a different period. So we went through the galleries, and we had a guide, and uh, 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 and he said, "Okay, and the next gallery is about the Holocaust." And my mother said, "We can skip that. I was there. It's okay. I know. <laughs> Show me the other one, you know." So there was something kind of very healthy and positive in it, but but the, but the thing was that in one situation, somebody talked to, to us about something, and then at some stage my mother said to him, you know, since, I don't know, the war started this summer, I pray to Jesus every night that things will get okay. And then I realized that by instinct she was so used being in this country, pretending not to be Jewish, that it was almost kind of a reflex, you know. It, and for me it was kind of strange standing next to her when she's saying thanking Jesus, you know, it was uh, I, it kind of gave me a glimpse of what what she had gone through. But you had other glimpses too. When, when she was with you, did she get to see the carrot house? Yes, yes, uh, because you know there, there is this uh, Polish architect who uh, who had built a house for me in a gap between two buildings, and. Uh, and uh, he wanted to build me a house in the proportion of my stories. Uh, and this house is totally functional. It's kind of, my son is very proud because it's listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the narrowest house in the world. And, uh, and uh, for my mother also, there was something very moving about that because it's called the Carrot House. There is a sign saying it's the Carrot House. And my mother told me that at some stage in the war, she, she just couldn't take it anymore and she said, to her father, it was after her mother and brother had already died. She said, "I can't fight anymore. You know, I, I don't care. I, I don't care to die, but I just can't keep on fighting. You know." And he says, "So you must stay alive, and because uh, uh, we must, you must take revenge on the Nazis." And my my mother said that it's the only time that she heard her father say the word revenge. You know, so. So he said, Why? what do you want me to do? And he said, look, th what the Nazis want to do is they want to wipe our name off this earth so nobody will ever remember that we existed. So he said, but your role is to stay alive, you know, and uh, to have children and to make sure that they could never deny our existence, that, you know, that people who would go down a street in Warsaw, you know, couldn't say those people were never here. 
And she said to me that when they built the carrot house and the sign was put, she said, I knew my father up there was smiling. Like mm -hmm. nobody could say that we didn't exist. We were here, there is a sign. It's like uh, it's signed and sealed. And it's still there. Yeah. yeah. Your life, your mother's life, your father's life, there's this sort of um, valence of trauma around it in a way, the Holocaust, um, the existential threat that you feel like you live under on a daily basis. Tell us how that uh, shows up in your writing, particularly this book. Well, well, you know, I really think that, that, that living in Israel, it's not a, or raising a family in Israel, being a son, being a father, I don't think it's a fundamentally different than doing it, let's say, in the U.S. or, or in other places in North America or in Europe. Uh, I think that you know that the, you have the same fear and the same yearning and the same, I don't know, frustrations. It's only that sometimes I feel that in Israel it's, a, it's the same life on kind of a, a higher volume. Like somebody's playing with that volume and, and you know, and sometimes it can get even distorted. But it's, it's, it's kind of more of the same, you know. I think there is a part there that they, I talk about some kind of a, a, about the fact that in Israel a, when I would go to playgrounds with my son when he was a, three years old, then always uh, the mothers would ask me if, when he's 18, if he'll go to the army or not. Because in Israel you have compulsory army service, and uh, so not going to the army it really takes very extreme measures, you know, you have to prove that you're mentally disturbed or do something about it. And I said to them, he's only three years old, like, why do you ask me about that? And, uh, and they said to me, ah, so you're one of those who wait for the last minute, like, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> And, and I think that, you know, that, that when you're a parent, you always have a notion, you always have this kind of fear that you reach this kind of a them if you do them, if you don't dilemma, that whatever you do, you know, will be problematic and maybe, and you find it difficult to live with your decision. But I think that, let's say, if, if you live in the U.S., this, this fear is obscure, you know? Like, I mean, you can imagine a situation, I don't know, your kid beats another kid up or... I don't know, or, or does drugs, or be, get somebody pregnant, or becomes pregnant. You can kind of, you can pick your fear, you know. But I think in Israel, it's very, very certain that from the moment that your son is born, you know that he's going to be, when he's 18 years old, you know he's going to join the army. And if he won't, then how can he claim to be a part of the society that in which an army like is necessary for their existence? And if he wills, then how can you sleep at night when you know that he's out there uh, endangering his life sometimes for things that actually, like, that politically and ideologically, you don't think you don't think should be done, you know? And you, you, and I've been like, you know, many of my friends. Like, it's not it's not only the people who get killed and maimed. There are many people who, who finish the army service, surviving them or even winning a medal, you know but surviving them by killing people or by seeing other people killed by, by them. And you know, and they are not there, and they carry those scars on their souls forever. So, so you know, so it's really like, it's uh, the, the fact that this is kind of built in to your society, you know, the fact that you know that every parent, who, every kid have arguments with his partner, have sleepless night over this kind of, of thing, you know, it's kind of, it's more like, I don't know, a Hunger Games psycho psychologies and what you would imagine kind of a, a normal society should be like. That's that's a very severe comparison, <laughs> but it's a fiction. Yeah, yeah I'm not, I know, to. I'm not to say that <clears throat> Israel is like this place, I'm just saying this kind of idea is that you put, is that, is that you know that the, something waits there in the end of the line and this thing is, is is scary and traumatic and and at the same time necessary. You know, it's really it's like I mean, like I don't know in the sixties when there was war in Vietnam. You know, and people didn't go to the wars and they say, you know what? If we fight there, if we won't fight there, the U.S. exists. You know, it's a given. It's not about that. But in Israel, it's not the case. You know, I mean, Israel will not exist one day without having an army and 
and educating your child to say, you know what, somebody should fight those wars, but it's not you, you should you, you set, seed them out. It's not something that you want to do. But again, I know at the same time, it's very complex. And it's a challenge, I think, to educate your child that when he goes there in a very early age, uh, he will not be corrupted by the inherent situations that you know, that every soldier who finds himself in a, in a situation of war, uh, let's say his morals uh, can be uh, damaged, you know? And I'm saying, especially if you are in a world that involves a civilian population, roadblocks, being in a position where, I don't know, you need to let a, a pregnant woman pass, but at the same time knows that, you know, that you can get detained for that, you know? So I'm saying uh, these, are, these are tough things to handle, and I think that, uh, that I think that the fact that armies all over the world, when they have compulsory service, they take people when they're very young, is the, for a very simple reason, you know, all the people just wouldn't stand it or wouldn't stand for it, you know. It's really in Israel, it's very well known that some position, you only take compulsory army soldiers and you don't take reserve duties because the reserve duty soldiers, they kind of, they're like 33, 34, you tell them do that and they say no. And, and it, is there no, and if they say no, there's no No, it's, 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 I'm saying it, it could go both ways. It could be like saying, whatever happens, you don't start shooting. But, you know, when you say that to a scared 18-year-old, he'll do what his commander says. When you say to somebody who's over 30, he says, you know what, I want to go home to my wife. I'm shooting, you know, put me on the trial after that. I'm shooting. Or it could go to the other way. Many times, you know, I think it also goes with compulsory army soldiers, but much more with reserve duties when you, somebody says to, to you, don't let anybody pass, and they say, this man is sick. He's, I'm not waiting for my officer to okay it. He needs to be in the hospital. He goes now. So it's actually, it's a common knowledge that, you know, that the compulsory uh, uh, service soldiers, they are, they, they are more likely to do what you tell them. In some position, they prefer having them for exactly that reason, you know, because they're young, and when you think about your son being there, then you know, then you, you would like to think or would like to wish that he'll have it in him, this ability to make those right decisions, but I think it's kind of a, it's a lot to ask from an 18 year old yeah. kid. Well, and that's an argument that I, you and your wife have clearly had already about what Lev will do. Yeah, yeah, no, for me again, uh, the way that I see it, if you, like, if you, who don't want your son to be in the army, then leave the country. You know what I'm saying? I, d I don't think, I don't, I'm saying about myself, I'm not judging other people, but I'm saying that in the bottom line, you know, it's a, if the army will only be populated by parents who are happy to send their kids there, then uh, this, you know, then I would like to imagine that if something wrong would be done, then my son would be there to stop it. You know, I don't want all the people who really don't have a problem uh, to run the, the army or to run the country or to run anything. You know, I, I want to, me and my, my family, you know, to, to assume the responsibilities everybody takes and to be able to stand up to all those kind of things that you don't want to take. Well, you can tell the conversation has taken a very grave turn. <laughs> and we can add some levity here, but I'll say that the book, if you've read Edgar's work, it is full of the light touch absurdities, congenial language, and just, yeah, you know his style, so you know how the book is told. So these are, we just sort of glanced along the surface here, but it's all in the telling, and it's all in the book, and it's wonderfully told. So why don't we move on to some questions from the audience. If you have a question, Please raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. There's a lady in orange, Frank, right in front of you. Ma'am, there's a mic right there. Um, I'm so curious how your parents gave you your name. As far as I know, there aren't too many people in Israel that have the name Challenge. You know, and um, you, you had alluded to the fact that perhaps they, they had said they didn't have any experience raising children, and maybe that is why they gave you the name. But it, it's an, it is an unusual name. 
Yeah, so in, in Israel, like most names have meaning, like, you know, like Native Americans, you know, so every, every name kind of has something uh, behind it. And Edgar, which means challenge, is a very rare, I would say, I think I was the first person named that name, and I think that even now in Israel, there were about f three or four more, you know. Uh, and uh, the reason uh, for that uh, was that uh, my, my mother wanted to have more children. She had already had two children, but she went through a series of miscarriages. And when she was pregnant with me, uh, there were complications. I got a jaundice. How do you call it? When you jaundice, yeah. Jaundice. Uh, so I got jaundice uh, when I was uh, still in her stomach. And, and the embryo cord was tied around my neck. Uh, so the doctor said to her, like, it's too early for the baby, you know, just to give him proper birth. Like, if, we, he'll, if he'll be born, he'll die anyway. So they recommended to take me out in parts, like, you know, to, because it was kind of like an abortion, but to, to do it kind of in a way that is safer to her. And my mother refused. And the doctor said to her, you already have two children. You know, if you do this, the kid's going to die and you'll die and you leave two orphans behind. And my mother said, eh, my husband is a good man. He, he, he's good with children. It's, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I was born in the six months of pregnancy. I weighed the 900 grams. Uh, my mother said that her first memory was hearing two doctors placing a bet on how long I'm gonna live before I die. Uh, and she called me challenge because it was a challenge to have me and uh, and it was a name that especially during my army service you know I kind of thought a lot about my name because you know when when you call the challenge and you have some kind of a, a stand-up comedian kind of sergeant major you know then every time he wants to be funny he says challenge you have a challenge go clean the toilets you know so and there was a guy in my regiment that his family name was after, and after means a 24-hour leave. So he would always say, after, have an after. And he would go, this guy would go home and he says, oh, challenge, and I have another challenge for you. Go clean the other regiment <laughs> toilets. And, and, and the funny thing is that also my family name, Keret, uh, Keret means a big city. So basically my full name is Urban Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a, a very good name for a pair of sneakers, but a <laughs> strange name for a human being. Another question. Yeah, right here in the blue. Um, first off, just thank you for what you do. I, uh, I'm just a massive fan of your work, and I give away your books more than any other book I give away, which, you know, is probably... Uh, it's frustrating for me because I have to go out and keep buying more of them, but I love reading it over and over again and sharing your work, so... Um, I had a question about your process because, uh, you know, your stories seem so effortless and they're clearly not. Um, and I'm just curious in terms of um, just simply, you know, are you working on multiple stories at a different time, um, you know, and a little bit of kind of how long just one story sort of takes you um, to, you know, come to a finished point? Uh, I, I don't work on more than one story at a time. Uh, and I think for me the the, uh, the important thing for me, let's say, when I write a story, is that I have to be very passionate about it, and at the same time, uh, not to know how to tell it or not to know what it means. You know, very much like my father, kind of oxymoron, kind of legacy, because if, because I think if I'm not passionate about it, then I won't write it. But if I'm passionate about it and I kind of got it totally figured out. You know, then, uh, then, then there is no kind of a adventuring, kind of going out and trying to f to to find it. It's a, I always kind of give this this example because I remember I remember it even though it was many years ago that I a, I was in a in a bus stop and I saw this guy and he was holding a newspaper under his arm and he had a disposable coffee cup. And uh, like every few seconds, he, he would come to take a sip from the coffee cup, and the newspaper would fall. <laughs> and the thing he would do would just take the newspaper and put it there again, and then come and take another sip, and it fell again. <laughs> and 
I was literally in tears. I was sitting next to him, and and because like you know, like I mean, I didn't even say to him, "Here, let me all the paper for you." I was just kind of like I was ruined and went home. And my my wife said, "What happened?" And I said, "I saw this guy, and it was so sad." And she said to me, "What guy?" And I told her, and she said, "That's not sad. Like that's a dumb person. You know, <laughs> you should just put the newspaper somewhere and have his coffee." Like. And and it's usually those kind of situations where you have very strong emotion, but people kind of don't relate to that emotion, that or you cannot even articulate it. Then basically, I think the story is supposed to be kind of a bridge between something private and something that other people can understand. And you know, and sometimes I kind of run home with teary eyes to my wife, and I said I saw something that was very sad, and I told her, tell her that, and she said, wow, that's really sad, and I say. Damn, there's no story here, you know. <laughs> because if you can, if you get it, then there's no need to do something so complicated and so arbitrary and so strange, you know, like writing a story. So there always has to be surprise or revelation in order to make it work. Yeah, this always com comes, or most of the time comes when you write. You know, I think, I think, I think that really. I, uh, one kind of a metaphor I use for writing, I, I say that it's like a trust fall. It's kind of you close your eyes and you fall back and you wait for the story to catch you, you know? And I think that, and I think that, and many times it doesn't, and you just write and nothing comes out of it, you know? This is usually what happens. But, but I think that really, that uh, I c one thing in common that I can say about all my better stories, that all of them are smarter than me. You know, the really is they are not, it's not as if I'm kind of like, I don't know, a, a guy, a, cl a clock builder, you know, say, oh, I'm going to put this here. And it's just, it's always kind of like saying, okay, and the guy goes, oh, did you see that? Where did this come from? Ah, oh, wow, okay. And so, so, so I really feel that, that this kind of a feeling of going on an adventure, going somewhere, and knowing that probably nothing will come out of it, but maybe sometimes kind of something comes out of it and this thing makes sense in a way that you can't make sense when you don't sit down and write. Mm. Yeah, right here in the front row. Here's the books. microphone. I haven't read your books, but after listening to you, you've awakened a curiosity in me and I would like to read them. So the, I... the, It's a trick. I always do that. <laughs> I go to an event, I raise people with curiosity and and you know, when they buy the book, I call my publisher and I say, ha, ha, ha. I, I, I met some more suckers in Philadelphia. <laughs> you remember this making some curious trick? I did that again. Okay, here's my, here's my <laughs> question. Yeah. Which qualities do you think you've inherited from your mother and which qualities from your father? It, okay, now, no, since my English isn't good, qualities are only the good things or also the bad things? <laughs> It's the characteristics. Okay, so so I think that uh, I, I have an aggressive side, like a confrontational side that I definitely inherited from my mother. You know, my mother, she, she's, she's as this, like, you know, her instinct is always to, to fight, but when this, she overcomes her instinct, she's really like the most amazing uh, and loving person in the world. But it's to such level that when my my father had died and my father really like, I, I've yet to see couples that they loved each other so much. So the next day, my, uh, we were supposed to go to the funeral and uh, uh, my mother said, I don't think I'm gonna go to the funeral. <laughs> and I said to her, but, but our father died there. She said, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just gonna wait home. And I said to her, why? And she said, well, you know, this woman is gonna come. I don't like her. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to her, yeah, but you know, we, uh, if you won't come, people uh, uh, will say that you didn't like uh, that. Ah, okay, I'm going. You know, and she gets dressed. But like the first instinct is like, oh, this woman is there. I'm not coming. You know, so so this kind of a, a side that I think it also has something positive to it, like kind of stubbornness and not kind of giving up and standing up for everything. I think I got from her, and. The side of, uh, I think, of kind of curiosity, always wanting to know more about people, and uh, always kind of find my, finding myself defending people that, let's say, my wife says, why, why do you stand up from them? Like, 
who are those people? Then, then uh, this is something that I definitely, I definitely got from my father, and uh, and I think that uh, that like like let's say my father, for example, he has this kind of absent mindedness, you know. So so. I kind of inherit it to the level that, you know, that if I think of something else, of a story, you know, I can find myself trying to eat a soap bar and realizing that something is wrong here, you know. So it's really like, so this idea of kind of being in one place and doing something else. So my dad was exactly this kind of guy, you know, that going somewhere and kind of like in Israel in the summer and then kind of halfway there realizing that you're going barefoot. You know, this kind of uh, experiences are... It's very much my dad, and and there were many things that my parents had that I wish that I would have inherited, you know, because both my parents were very very competent, you know, they kind of they knew how to do stuff, you know, like uh, if a button f fell off, they knew how to kind of uh, uh, put it back on, they knew how to fix things, and and I got n nothing of that, you know. <laughs> Time for a few more questions. Um, let's see, there's a gentleman in red there, and then there's a lady about three, half the way back there. Frank, you'll see her when you get back. So I was wondering how you concoct these stories. Is it from direct observation and then a little tweak to them? Or do you just sort of work like an abstract painter and just pull it out of your subconscious? So when it comes to to fiction, I kind of pull it out of my subconscious. I think that the, that when I finish a story, it takes me a lot of time to try and understand to what what experience I had. It relates because I feel like I'm saying something, and this something is meaningful, and it describes something that I know well. But it's not not even always intuitive that I'm writing a story because. I don't know, somebody did that to me or because I had a fight with my wife. Or so, so it is very abstract in nature. I think that the things that start a story, is a many, many times it could be an image or it could be a sentence or it could be like something that you know that is kind of a, that I can sense but I cannot even say, you know. So it could be like a tone of a voice. Sometimes like you... You sit in a place and you hear a guy speaking on the phone and you say, I can write a story about this guy, but when you want to write a story, it's not about anything he said, you know, it's about kind of how intense he was and what kind of relationship did he have with space around him. So usually th those are the starting points for stories. First of all, I enjoyed your, is it on? It's on. I, I enjoyed your presentation very much, but I'm wondering about the translation process. If you write in Hebrew, and who puts it in English? And do you feel that the English captures your use of language the same as the Hebrew? And is it in any other languages besides Hebrew and English? Uh, yeah, uh, well, so I'll show off in the beginning and then answer your question. So my books came out in uh, 37 languages and in more than 40 countries. That's, I always like to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, but having said that, really, translation is something that I think that most readers kind of take it for granted that, you know, that they, they think that, let's say, a, an idea or, or a story is like a liquid and, a, and the language is like a glass. So basically, when you translate something from Hebrew to English, from English to French, you basically kind of spill it from one glass to the other. But, but languages are fundamentally different and they actually create different realities. You know, somebody told me that about one of the Scandinavian language that they, they have the same name, let's say, for the color blue and the color purple. So whenever there is a hit and run accident and they have to, to stop cars and bring them, they bring all the blue and purple one. Because for people, when they say the name of the color, this is how they determine, you know, the, how the car looked like. So, so I think that, you know, it's like a... Uh, in uh, uh, in uh, English, you have all kinds of verb forms that we don't have in Hebrew. So let's say, to say, I'm going. So in Israel, you can't say I'm going. You can only say I go, you know. And on the other hand, uh, when you talk in first person in Hebrew, uh, in English, nobody can tell that the, the sex of the speaker, 
but in Israel you can, you know. I can tell you this funny story that I, I wrote a story for, for the, uh, the radio show This American Life, you know, it will be aired this weekend. And, the, and I, it's a first person narrative about somebody who, who has a partner and they, and they break. After many years, you know, they stop be living together. And I wrote it in a f first person, masculine. And I wrote the first person masculine, I wrote this story. And then uh, when it was translated, I got back from the translator, I realized that when you read it, you can't see if it's a man or a woman. And then I suddenly tried to imagine it if a woman would read it. And I said, wow, it's more interesting actually if a woman reads it. Because some of the, con uh, because let's say if there was some, something about the fight that the that, uh, couple had that sounded kind of a, because the woman was kind of jealous of her husband interacting with another woman, then suddenly when it was a woman and the husband was jealous of the woman interacting with another woman, there was some, something actually deeper because it was, he was jealous of the intimacy. He was not jealous of kind of potential kind of sexual intercourse. So, so I'm saying, so just by the act of translation, I basically kind of was able to reinterpret my own story and the, kind of make it better. So it's really, really strange how this transformation actually changes the story. You don't read the same story. You're not exposed to the same story. And uh, I can say that, you know, that I think writers are very, very sensitive for the work being translated. Uh, Israel's national poet, uh, Chaim Nachman Bialik, he said that uh, reading a work in translation is like kissing somebody through a handkerchief, you know, <laughs> which kind of has a kinky charm to it, but, you know, <laughs> But we would prefer not to, you know. So, so, so I think that, uh, that every writer, when he uh, sees his work translated uh, to a language he can read, he says, oh, you know, this isn't going well, you know. And I would want to argue, like any other uh, writer would argue, that in my case, it's the translation process, process is even more difficult and even more impossible. And the reason for that, there are two. One of them because I write very, very short texts. So basically, if you imagine a story like a structure, then kind of every sentence is like a supporting column. But when you write minimalistic text, it supports more parts in the ceiling. So if you have a word that has a double meaning in Hebrew, and it doesn't have that meaning in English, uh, the second meaning in English, suddenly you, you see like half of the ceiling kind of caving in, you know? So. Uh, so uh, what I want to say is that what's also kind of strange about my story is that I write them in a colloquial Hebrew speech. And uh, when I started writing, it was very uncommon because usually Israeli writers would write in high register very much because of like, the Bible, you know, the Bible. It's, I always say to other writers, you know, if you're Italian, when you write, you have kind of the shadow of Dante's work, you know. If you write in English, you have the shadow of Shakespeare. But we in Israel, we have the shadow of the Bible. And you know, and with all due respect to Shakespeare and Dante, the Bible not only outsold them both, you know, <laughs> but, but allegedly it was, it was written by a guy who did a couple of, he had more achievement even, you know, outside the sphere of, so, so it's one hell of a shadow, and, and I think that, you know, that when I started writing colloquial speeches, there were people, critics that were against that. But what attracted me to the Israeli colloquial speech is that it's unlike any other slang or colloquial speech in any other country, and it has to do with the unique story of Israel. And what basically happened in Israel is that uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, people stopped speaking in Hebrew. You know, they went on to the diaspora, so if they would come to the US, they would speak English, you know. If they would go to Europe, they would speak the native language or Yiddish or Ladino, it depends where they were. And basically the idea behind it was that it was inappropriate to ask where the restrooms are or if I, you could have another cake in the whole language of the Bible. So through those 2,000 years, Jews knew Hebrew very well, but just wouldn't speak it. And then at one arbitrary moment, this kind of frozen language was kind of defrosted in the microwave of time, and everybody started speaking it. Uh, and the effect was very, very strange because they could speak in a language that you know that if Abraham or Isaac would enter the room, they would understand everything they say about, but 
unlike Abraham and Isaac, you know, they had a smartphone, you know, they had all those kind of things, they had the water faucets, you know, a, a gear shift, all those kind of things that didn't exist in the Bible and didn't exist in the language. And the moment they start speaking, they needed immediately to find a way to kind of stuff those holes. So they imported words from other languages, they made up words. You know, Hebrew is a, is a, it's a kind of a dream language for a writer because I can make up a word and people are used to understanding the words out of the context because the story of the spoken Hebrew language, they, most of the time people would use the words that you didn't understand, so you basically know how to figure it out. And that creates a colloquial speech that, is, that keeps switching between registers and time as you speak it, because when you say a sentence in, in Hebrew, a slang sentence, that it could be like two words in ancient biblical Hebrew, and then one word from Russian, and then another word from the English, and then another word from the Bible. And this is kind of a mix like of between kind of a, the King James Bible and the, and the, and the Jay-Z rap song, you know? <laughs> when you take a word from the Bible and a word from the rap and put it together, and when my work is being translated, always my translators say to me like, oh, I really like this piece, so what do you say, up or down? Because you could either take all the register up or take all the register down, but you cannot keep this kind of inner tension that exists in Israel in Hebrew speech, but also exists in the Israeli society. Because if you think about it, we are ancient people, but in your country, you know, we are very conservative and religious, but also kind of anarchistic and liberal, you know, so all those things that, that kind of echo very much in the language gets lost in translation. And unfortunately, there we have to end it. Abraham and Isaac say the best book since the Bible. <laughs> Seven Good Years by Edgar Carrick. Please join me in thanking Edgar. <laughs>